Okay. In this presentation, I will show how the open insulin project is going to produce two analogs of insulin, glargine and Lispro. And so right here is an image of human insulin. And there are two chains, chain A and chain B, and they are held together by two disulfide bonds, which keep the two chains from floating away from each other. Okay. Um, and here's an image of how the human body produces insulin. And there are similarities to how the human body produces insulin and how open insulin is going to do it. They both create one peptide, then cleave it as opposed to creating two peptides. So you can see here, it's one long peptide. Um, they both attach a signal sequence to translocate the peptide to a favorable location. In E. coli, this is um, going to be translocated to a place for proper folding and in yeast to a place for secretion outside of the cell. And then finally, they both use proteases that are enzymes that cleave proteins to split the peptide into chains A and B. So um, with the um, signal sequence that's in, that's in red here, so the human body does that. It moves it along. And then, um, so for the proteases, it's shown on the bottom left how it's going to be cut. And um, we're actually using this last um, protease carboxypeptidase in our open insulin project for the last cleavage. So we're doing the same thing. Okay, here are the analogs of insulin that we are attempting to produce. Um, we're attempting to produce the, the analog Lispro, which is fast acting, and Glargine, which is long acting. With Lispro, the only switch is um, on chain B, the human insulin has it proline and then lysine. With Lispro, it's switched. So it's lysine and proline. And that's actually what gives it its name. The lysine proline is Lispro. In glargine, there are three changes. The, um, in chain A, we have the amino acid N becoming G and then we have two R's at the very end. These modifications are important in the roles as cleavage sites um, for, for our project. I'll show that later. Oh, David, can I ask a quick question? What are the oh, sure, two sure. R's? Yeah? What are the two R's at the end of glargine? Oh, um, so they're arginine. Oh, okay. And then the KP at the end of the list row is? Yeah, so um, up here, um, there, it's kind of confusing. Oh, the, um, lysine is actually represented by the symbol K, um, um, just because uh, leucine, I believe, is using the letter L, so they had to use another letter. So this is lysine and proline. Oh, and again, the, the name for glargine comes from the uh, amino acid substitution. So you have uh, oh, a glycine see, yeah. and two arginines. Oh, my God. So glargine. That's true. That's yeah. true. Oh, my <laughs> God. <laughs> okay. The two Thank strategies you. for producing insulin, um, glargine from yeast and Lispro from E. coli. The advantages for producing glargine from yeast are... Glargine can be secreted out of the cell, so no need to lyse and then remove cell debris. So that's shown here on this image. The glargine is going to be secreted out, which is so much easier because um, you won't have all of this debris inside here to, act, uh, to um, later try to purify. Um, then glargine can be inserted into yeast genomic DNA, so there is no need for continuous antibiotic selection pressure to remove cells that have lost their plasmid. And then the third advantage, glargine only needs one protease, hex2, to cleave the peptide inside insulin, as opposed to with E. coli, um, we need three proteases. And each step, um, you know, adding a protease takes like, you know, half a day or a day. So that's, um, that's what a lot more time to, um, to cleave the um, Lispro. 
um, okay, advantages of producing Glispro from E. coli. E. coli only takes six hours to grow and express as opposed to yeast four days. Um, and not only is it four days, but then you have to continuously go into the lab each of those four days to keep feeding it. So that's, that's a big hassle. Um, and then also with E. coli, it's easier to transfer the plasmids inside of E. coli than it is to insert linearized plasmids into yeast genomic DNA. So even though it's better to have um, it inserted into the yeast genomic DNA, um, it's just simpler to transfer a plasmid. Um, and um, as I mentioned here, glargine can be secreted out of the cell, so namely to lice, and then remove the cell debris. That was the first advantage. So here, this is showing how we're going to have glargine secreted outside of the cell. We're attaching it to this mating alpha protein. And um, on the left, you can see what's happening. This is how yeast communicates with um, another type. So we have the mating type alpha um, on the left in red, and then we have the mating type A in blue on the, on the right. Um, and so what they, they, they're secreting pheromones to, um, that goes out outside of their cell to um, say, hey, I'm over here, and they draw each other together. So um, the mating type alpha pheromone is shown in this red square that's being secreted out and then it's gonna be attached to a receptor on the mating type A. And then that draws them together. And then um, on the third um, segment here, it's showing how they are finally combined together. So they start off as haploids and then they end up with a diploid. So they're mixing their genes here. So we're just, we're using that same way that yeast does it. Um, just attaching the mat alpha to our glargine and so it'll pull the glargine outside, the, outside of the cell. Okay, and this is how we're going to insert our glargine inside of the yeast genomic DNA. So on the left side, we're looking um, at the plasmid that um, Jan, um, um, he made the sequence here. Um, and um, so this shows all of the sites that we could cut the plasmid to make it linearized. And um, when Jan showed me like where he wanted to cut it, I was like, what are you doing? You're destroying the histidine. Because he, he picked the site, uh, Sal 1, to cut it. So he cut it right in half. But then he said, that's the point. You want to damage it. And so when it, it's inside yeast, it'll heal itself by um, attaching uh, both of those segments back together again. So if we call this top part, part A and then the bottom part, part B, you could see in yeast, um, when it's going into the genomic DNA, it's gonna attach part A to part B. Um, and then, um, so that's the pink, the histidine that was damaged. And the blue will be um, the linearized plasmid. And then we have um, A attaching to B, A to B, A to B. So um, using yeast mending, um, its own way to, that it, you know, fixes any damages, it's going to include our inserts. So hopefully we have like, this is showing like three inserts. Um, we might only have one insert or two or three. So the more the better because each, each time we have an insert, it will include our gene to produce glargine. Um, and the way we're going to select for the most inserts is by, <clears throat> excuse me, increasing the amount of canamycin um, because each insert also has a canamycin resistant gene in there. In the next slide, this is what um, we're planning to do in the future. Um, we're going to have our um, co a colony is gonna be picked and um, so each of the, each row is going to have its own colony, and then um, then going from this column, going to the right, it's going to 
have an, an increased amount of the antibiotic canamycin added. So um, this might just have like, um, you know, just a very little amount of canamycin. So most of them will live because um, they had at least like one insert. And then um, the next column will have like double that amount. Um, and then so this row right here in row three, it died out because it couldn't take that canamycin um, amount. And then, so we just keep increasing, increasing. And then finally, like here, um, it'll have the most inserts because it survived the most canamycin. So this is the project. Um, and we were hoping like maybe to have a robot do this because it's very tedious to um, put our culture like in each of these um, wells here. And besides being tedious, we want to have it so each each well will have the same amount. Um, so that'd be really cool with the robot. Okay. Um, and then for inserting the oops, inserting the plasmid with Lispro into E. coli, it does kind of the same thing. We um, we use a transformation procedure, um, which is um, a heat shock. And um, to, for that brief time that um, we're um, giving it that high heat, it'll open up the cell wall and then the plasmids will go in. And then we're using the same way for selection, we're using canamycin. So um, only the cells that have the plasmid with the, the canamycin resistance will survive. We also want the list probe to go to the paraplasmic area of the cell as opposed to the cytoplasmic space, which has um, the unwanted tangled proteins that E. coli makes of its own. It makes its own housekeeping proteins and we don't want that. So um, there are different strategies for um, just getting the paraplasmic proteins. Um, and so we've tried these three different lysing methods. Sonication, um, which does a strong vibration to break open the cell walls. Um, we've tried that, but it seems to be too, um, too, too strong. Um, and it seems like um, we're getting a lot of this cytoplasmic proteins. It's too rough. Um, and then the next thing we've tried are detergents. Um, so um, we found that Triton's the best. Uh, we tried SDS, but it interferes with the column. Um, so um, we think we're gonna do that one. And um, the paper that we're trying to emulate is using osmotic shock. Um, and we've tried that as well, but it doesn't seem like it's bursting the cell walls. We're thinking the cell walls are too flexible. So um, even with, making um, with osmotic shock, we, um, I'll show you the next couple slides, but it'll make it so the, the cells expand to like double the amount of size that it is normally, but the cell walls are just too flexible. It doesn't seem like it's bursting it. Okay, and this is showing how we're transloading, translocating the Lispro to the paraplasmic space. We're attaching Lispro to Ecotin and ecotin is a naturally produced enzyme of Lispro, um, or, I mean, naturally produced enzyme of E. coli, which is found in the paraplasmic space. So we're um, using E. coli's own mechanism for moving um, the protein ecotin, and we're attaching it to Lispro to make it move there. And this is how we're hoping the osmotic shock will work. We grab our culture and then we spin it down and then we mix the pellet with a solution of sucrose. And then um, that sucrose will be absorbed inside the cell. And then we spin it down again and we grab the pellet. Um, and then we mix it with a solution of water and then hopefully through osmosis, the water will just rush in um, and then burst 
the cell, and then that will spell out um, the list pro. It doesn't seem like it's working right. Um, so we've tried different things, like we try to put it, um, when we put it in water, we make the water really cold to make it um, more brittle, the, the, the outer membrane, but um, we're still having problems with that. And this is how we're trying to purify. We're putting it through, for Lispro, we're putting it through a nickel column. And um, so this is the chemistry, how it's working. The Lispro has been designed with uh, six histamine amino acids um, attached to the Lispro, and that will stick to the nickel column. And then any other proteins, the nonspecific proteins will just rush through because they will not have the six histamine tag. And over here on the right, you can see the chemistry involved where um, histidine, it looks almost like a metazol, and a metazol is what we're going to use to elute it out. So what happens is the metazol will take the, the histidine place, um, attaching it to the nickel, and that will force um, the Lispro with its histamine tag to drop off. So during the solution, we'll also get some imidazole that'll come out and we have to uh, purify that out later. We're gonna use dialysis for that. Okay, here's the FPLC machine. It's been a godsend um, because it's, it's so helpful. Um, it um, uses a, a pump to force the protein through the column. Um, before we had this machine, we had to use just gravity to put each of our solutions into the column. And um, that took forever. It would go drip, drip. Whereas when we have a pump, we can go drip, 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 drip. Um, we also tried when we were using gravity to use like a syringe to force it to go through the column faster, but then you have to you know, kind of balance it. And um, with me, I've done a couple times where I tried to squirt it in with the syringe, but then it, it didn't quite stick. And then I build the sample right out and, you know, a couple days worth of growing and lysing just wasted. So this is a, a better way to do it. Um, so here, so the yellow would be the sample and it's gonna go through the tubing into the pump and then it goes next to into the column. And then um, the tubing will be grabbed into um, over here shows um, this first thing it goes into is a UV, de UV detector, which detects the protein. And then the tubing continues through a conductor which measures salt concentration. There's also this um, gadget here, which mixes the um, solutions. We can make it so it mixes one part solution A to say two parts solution B, or one part A to five parts B. What we would like to do, and I haven't been able to figure it out, um, maybe somebody else can help with this. Um, we would like to make it so the mixture is not just a constant mixture, but it would increase the concentration. So like for, um, with this nickel column with the metazole, we would like to maybe start off with, you know, 1% of metazole and then slowly get to 5% and 10% and 20%. And then we would know exactly when um, the elution takes place. Because right now we're just kind of guessing what um, the concentration of a metazole would be. This also works besides the nickel column for Lispro with his tag. It would also work with glargine, which we use an ionic exchange column and uses salt to elute. Um, and to the, on the bottom right, it shows the panel. Um, so yeah, we click the start button and then usually we start off with a flow rate of about two milliliters a minute because we don't want to force the protein out of the column. We want it to stick to the top of the column. And then um, when we get to the lucian part, we um, speed it up to maybe four milliliters a minute because now we want to push it out. We want to push the protein out. This also has this cool feature for purging. Um, so after you finish your experiment, you want to get it ready for the next experiment. So you could just set it to, you click purge and it goes to 20 milliliters a minute. So it flushes everything out really quickly. 
And um, over here we have this uh, feature, you click this button mark, which marks um, what solution you are, um, you're putting in. Um, and this is gonna be shown on the, on the software here. So here's the software and by clicking mark, it shows, um, so now we're starting our sample and then we um, click mark again and then this will be the next buffer and then it shows on our software um, what sample, what, what um, step we're, we're doing. So um, you can watch on the computer screen as it goes along on the x-axis, it shows per minute. Um, and the top line is the protein concentration. And then on the bottom line is the salt concentration. So we have our sample entered and then um, we, add our, we add our equilibrium buffer kind of just to wash away uh, the sample uh, from the column. Um, and then hopefully the protein of interest will stick to the top. Um, and then we do another wash just in case there's some straggler proteins that are still stuck. Um, they might, for example, with the histidine tag, um, our sample um, that we want to keep has six histidines on it, but there might be some proteins and just in nature that might have two histidine amino acids in a row. So I'm kind of, it might just kind of stick to the nickel column and we want to flush that away. So that's what this washes. And then the final step is elution. And as you can see here, the protein bumps up um, right when it, it goes through that, um, goes through here. And so then we grab it into some test tubes. This image actually was done uh, with Glargine. Um, and so we're looting with, through an ionic exchange column. And with the ionic exchange, the elution happens with an increase of salt. So you could see on the bottom red, um, when the, the salt increased, that's when this elution happened. And there's a little bit of a lag here um, between these two detectors. Um, if you go back, you see it first is going through the protein detector and then it goes through the salt concentration detector. So there's a little delay. The, the red line is a little bit after um, this, the top line. Okay, um, so I wanted to show you with the list pro um, the strategy for um, how we're cutting it with the proteases. So um, over here, these are the three proteases that we are using. The first one is thrombin. So it cuts between the R and the G. And so then we can get rid of everything to the left, which is the ecotin and the, this uh, linker. Um, and then we add trypsin, which cleaves on the carboxyl side of K and R, except when followed by P. So you can see on the, these gray spaces here, that's where the trypsin will cut the right side of, of um, R. So the carboxyl um, shown on this image is on the right side. Um, so that's where we're gonna cut. Um, so we cut all of that away, um, but there's still this R at the end because the cleavage is only gonna happen on the right side. So we have to get a, a, some kind of protease to cut this last um, amino acid here. And that's where carboxyheptidase happens. Because it grabs um, the KRR that's unattached on the carboxyl side. And it will be unattached on the carboxyl side because this will be cut away and then I'll remove it. Um, with trypsin, it's very dangerous because it could start cutting away any R and K um, that could be inside of our um, insulin. For example, it's, we have an R here on the chain B and then we also have a K in chain B. Um, but fortunately, because of that change um, with the flip, which put the Lispro I mean, which put the lysine and then the proline, that's um, right here, it says cleaves on the carboxyl side of K and R except when followed by P. So it's followed by P, so we're okay here. 
the trypsin will not cut that. However, it will cut this R, um, but it will cut it mildly because another condition for trypsin is K and R are also mildly inhibited from cleavage when they are next to an acidic D or E amino acid. And this one has the E on the left side. So uh, the trypsin will cut it, but slowly. Um, so that help us time it out. We're gonna send this down to BioCurious um, and on their HPLC machine, we're gonna add trypsin and we're gonna just time it out to see how long it takes um, for it to cut, you know, where we want it to cut, um, but not cut this part. Um, oh, and then I wanted to show down here on the bottom um, uh, for Lispro, if there are protease that cleaves at the end of Lispro's B chain, um, if, if we had a protease that could cut at P and T, then we would only need one protease um, because we could have it right here, cut it cleanly. Um, and then we would put a PT here, which would cut it. So then uh, the beginning would be free. And then we would put a PT here. Um, and then we'd have the uh, bottom uh, chain A in yellow free. But fortunately, uh, so we can't do that with uh, Lispro because there's no protease that cuts PT. But with Glargine, there is a protease, KEX2, that cleaves um, the RR. And um, with Glargine, um, as you may remember, it does end with RR. That was the difference between glargine and human insulin. It, it ends with RR. So with glargine, it's, um, that makes it very convenient because now we could have KEX2 cleave at the end of RR. And then we could have like RR here at the beginning of this blue chain B. And then we could have like RR here. Um, so we would just need one protease with glargine. Okay, and here's the gel that we've done that shows um, the the thrombin cleavage. Um, so, like the okay, the first column shows a sample taken of the flow through. So it's going to have all of our non-specific proteins because um, these have not stick to the top of the column, and then we wash any more nonspecific proteins. And um, so now we get fewer. And um, so far this is holding um, our complete construct is 30 kilodaltons. And we don't see that really here. So, so we have the flow through the nonspecific and the wash with the nonspecific, but the specific protein we want is Lispro and we don't really see that. So that's good, it didn't flush through yet. Um, then when we do the elution, we do see it, um, which is great. Um, this one below it, I'm not sure what that is though, because you think um, we should just see the 31 here. And then finally, the, um, at the last column, this is where we have added thrombin. And so by adding thrombin, it will cut the size of the 30 kilodalton into its two segments here. Um, so shown on the bottom, um, we have ecotin plus the linker um, plus the site where the thrombin will cut and the histidine tag um, and then Lispro. And over here, the total size is going to be 30 kilodalton. So that's what we started with. And then um, by cutting it right here at this cleavage site between the R and G, the left side is 19.5 kilodalton, which is the ecotin and the linker. Um, and then on the right side is the list pro. So that's what we see on our last column. We see 19.5 and 10.5. There's still some other bands here. We're not sure what they are. And it could be the, the 10.5 is actually the one below um, what we're hoping it to be. Um, but this is where we would do like a Western blot because that would mark exactly which band has the list pro. So this is how um, after we purify, uh, we want to get rid of the elution uh, and the salt that um, have eluded out. 
So we grab this dialysis cassette and then we put in like a, a milliliter of, of the lucian. And um, then we put it in a beaker of water that's like 200 milliliters. Uh, below it kind of shows how it does it. Um, and so we put it in a beaker of water for like an hour and then we um, discard the beaker um, after um, it's shown in red, all of the lucian um, and salt are in there. So we discard the beaker um, and then we add another 200 milliliters of water and we wait an hour and then we discard that um, beaker of the um, of all of these red um, lucians and salt, and then we do it again. So we're uh, so we start off with one milliliter to two hundred, and then we do that three times. So basically, we're diluting it one to eight million. So it really gets diluted. So we almost all of what's inside of the dialysis will be our protein and, and no um, salt or lucians or, or uh, like aminazole. Okay, the three methods for testing if we have insulin. Um, the first one is um, blotting. This, so the sample is soaked with a solution of insulin antibodies to see if they bind to the antigens of the sample. And this is um, performed at CCL. So we've tried that several times with antibodies that we purchased. Uh, the next method for testing is HPLC, which is a sample um, is eluded through a column and then the protein peak is compared to a positive control. So um, we've, um, we've done this already with the positive control. We have a commercial list pro that they've tested. So we know the peak that um, is expected now. And then once we um, give them our sample, we can compare that with the positive control. Another method for testing is mass spec. Um, and with that, the sample is blasted and then the fragments are summed to see if they equal the mass expected. So we have to uh, send that out to a lab. So um, just like when you go to the doctor, when you go out of network, it's gonna be a little, be a little more expensive. So we're gonna have to pay for that. Okay. Um, so this is showing how the blotting works. So we put the protein on top of the nitrocellulose membrane. And then we um, first add the primary antibody, which is um, specifically um, for the insulin antigen. And then we wash that away. And um, the, any stray antibodies that are not sticking will be washed away. And then we um, add the secondary antibody, which sticks to the primary antibody. And um, with the secondary, secondary antibody, we just have to make sure that it's going to stick to the primary antibody by it being from the same species. For example, the primary antibody is from mouse. So it's a mouse primary antibody that sticks to insulin. And then we have to make sure the secondary antibody will stick to a mouse antibody. And the secondary antibody has the signal. Um, so we add an enzyme and then it will give us um, a red color is shown on the bottom here where we did a dot blot. And a dot blot is where we add um, 10 microliters of our sample um, onto this nitrocellulose membrane. And um, so we did that um, with commercial Glardine is a positive control and commercial Lispro is a positive control. And then Tex2 um, is gonna be our negative control because there's no way the antibody will stick to KEX2 because um, the antibody is you know, made for, for insulin. And then here is our sample that we've done. And um, we did get a signal here. But it's like, hey, wait, how come the commercial Glargine didn't give us any signal um, and commercial Lispro? And um, we believe that what we purchased was an antibody for pro-insulin as opposed to an antibody for insulin. And with pro-insulin, um, it's the precursor of insulin, which has the chain A attached to chain B um, 
And then, um, well, actually it would be chain A, then chain C, and then chain B. The chain C is a linker of, um, to go from chain A to chain B. And um, so we're thinking that um, the antibody we bought was for uh, pro-insulin and in in it's attaching to the chain C, which- the that, commercial... that should be fairly well documented, right? Exactly what the target is. Um, so we're gonna have to go back and just double check the, uh, the, the primary antibody that we uh, tried. Um, it, it did say for pro-insulin and um, right. yeah. Um, but yeah, so I mean, yeah, yeah, we, that would maybe, make we sense. Could, maybe we can get our money back for that. Um, <laughs> if, 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 I mean, I mean, if they did advertise it for, for insulin. We would also like, um, so yeah, so this is our first purchase of a primary antibody. Then we, we bought some more that actually did say for insulin itself, not just pro-insulin. And um, the, our second purchase didn't work still. And um, I'm hoping that they can send us a positive control that they know works for what they sold us so that we could find out exactly what step is not working. There's a website out there somewhere that uh, essentially compares different antibodies that are available uh -huh. and sort of does user reviews of them essentially yeah uh, i can dig that up again we've looked at it in the past oh another yeah. question on the primary antibody do they ever sell it so it's specifically for an antigen but it also has a signal or would that be too specific and very expensive you can yeah they're ex you can have it made it tends to be very expensive yeah and David, what was the exact antibody that you used? Um, I could, you want me to email to you? I sure. could put it on Mattermost, the, the two that we've purchased so far. So I'm yeah, yeah you can do that. Yeah. Okay, cool. I'll take a note. So there's a BioCompare has an antibody search and there's also uh, antibodyreview.com. And both of them, I believe, have warnings if uh, specific antibodies were found not to work. There's lots of variability between antibodies because, you know, each of these companies can generate their own antibodies and start selling them, but they're not all interchangeable. Oh, Patrick, can you show that like in the chat? Uh, yeah. Cool. So here's antibody review, it's just antibodyreview.com. The other one was, uh, where was the other one? If you're searching for antibody reviews, it is not the 2002 movie antibody, which has the reviews on Rotten Tomatoes. That is not it. Uh, where is this other site that I found? Anyway, I'll, I'll dig for it some more. Oh, cool. I'll, put, I'll put it in the chat. Okay. Uh, this is how we do the Western blot. We have, our, we've done the gel and now we want to transfer all those proteins to the nitrocellulose membrane. So this is a really cool gadget with that we have a CCL um, and it only takes about eight minutes to move it. Um, so that was really cool. Um, and so this is what it looks like after it transfers from the gel to the uh, membrane. Is that this a is CCL, what, that uh, Western blotter? What's that? Is that Western blotter at CCL? Yeah, this transfer blot. Nice. It's great. Yeah, yeah. Because we we've had like really old uh, Western blot cassettes that I don't think anybody's ever used. This looks like a much nicer system. Yeah, I remember from lab, um, from at school that we would actually have the nitrocellulose on top of the gel, and then we try, we would just sit it overnight, and then it would like um, just using um, a pressure that goes up. It would, it would it would move the proteins that way but i remember mm -hmm. it just took so long 
um, where this one just takes eight minutes. Wow, nice. So was that just uh, was that just around in the lab, or because I I don't remember purchasing anything recently like that. It's right next to the centrifuge. I don't know where we got it. Uh, meaning we've always had it around. Yeah. Right? yeah. Okay, interesting. We may actually want to go through some of our old equipment and get rid of the old uh, Western blot equipment that we have. So when the transfer takes place, um, you don't actually see all this pink here. Um, the pink is from um, the next step when we want to see where the proteins have been um, transferred. Um, we add Ponso, which is like a pink dye that sticks to protein. And it's really cool in that um, it, it's a good way to test just to make sure that it's still working and then you can, you can continue with your experiment. Um, so you add the ponso and then since it just sticks to the very top of the protein, you can just wash it away with water and then continue. As opposed to like if you try to use Kamase blue, um, it'll just stain everything blue and there's no way to get rid of it. So this is um, the ponso is great. What we were hoping for, as you can see on the fourth column, um, it does have a little pink on the 10.5 um, size, the kill Dalton size down here, which is the correct size for Lispro. But then when we continue to add the antibodies um, and, and to see if we had any Lispro here, we didn't get any signal. And it, it, it could have been that the antibodies didn't work or that it's just this is so, um, uh, so uh, dim that um, it wasn't enough to show. But this is where we were hoping to show right there at 10.5. Okay, and this is the HPLC machine. Um, this is the one at CCL. Um, it, it's exact make that over at BioCurious, um, but they also have the software to run it. And so, um, so down at BioCurious, Jay has done a run with uh, the commercial list pro and this is the peak that it got. And so what we would do is we would bring our sample down there um, and then we would add the trypsin to cleave out um, to separate the chain A and the chain B. Um, and and we would have it so like the HPLC machine would grab the sample every say five minutes. And then we would know exactly when the trypsin has cut the chain a and B, um, and then we would stop it because we didn't want the trypsin to continue, you know, and chew away our, our um, the chain B that has a, some other um, arginines in it. Okay, and this is just to show how people can get involved. So um, every Sunday we uh, start at 12 and then um, with the general work meeting and then um, the science working groups start at one. And there are also other ad hoc topic discussions as needed through the afternoon. So there's the link. Okay. Thanks, David. Uh, no problem. Yeah, thank Can we you. We asked David. questions. Sure. If I can answer them, but I'm going to need help from like uh, Margo and Jessica and anybody else. <laughs> Yeah, there's one. So first off, this was really great. And I actually haven't seen uh, all this laid out at once. And so this was a really great presentation, even as a member who's been here for over a year now. So emphatic thank you. Thanks. One question on the business side uh, that we're thinking through right now is um, what levels of titer we expect we'll be able to achieve or really what type level of header we need to achieve to make production economical at scale. And so wondering if you have any sense or any estimate for what initial titers might end up being um, once all of the strain engineering aspects been debugged. What do you mean by titer? Concentration of protein in solution. Oh for like um, Pekia pastoris when it's um, secreted. Um, 
Yeah, I don't know, because we haven't proven yet that we have the insulin. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, but, and we're kind of doing it kind of in a, um, a small scale so far. We're just using, um, um, like, we're just kind of using it in a flask and shaking it as opposed to a bioreactor, which can give a lot higher percentage. Um, yep. Yeah. So um, we're working on it. So um, I think Jan is trying to get his bioreactor to work over there. But the actual production costs for uh, large scale production for insulin, it's like a tiny, tiny fraction of the actual resale cost, right? Resale price. Oh, yeah. yeah it's like a couple of cents expensive. or something. Yeah, that's yeah. definitely true. But of course, that's conditional upon actually having a titer that yep. uh, for which that's true. And so it's more of a question, really, it's more of a business question around what titer level do we need to achieve mm -hmm. um, the price point that, you know, is conducive to our mission. And then based on that, that would be a goal that we set for um, scale up fermentation team once yeah. that's in place and once the strain engineering has been debugged. And, and different different processes can have, you know, orders of magnitude, different yields as well. So yeah, it's definitely a good question to ask. Yeah, oh, yeah and the, the scale that you produce at will be huge uh, in, impact on how much it mm -hmm. costs and how your distribution yeah. network is. So there's a lot of moving pieces. Oh, yeah, David, can you uh, post the link to your presentation in the chat? Um, which one? This one here? The presentation you just gave, can you post it in the chat? There's a link for that? You mean um, the, the, this one or the one that we recorded? The present the slides. So if you have them saved. Oh, and oh yeah, 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 yeah. OK. okay. Um, I didn't put it on the, um, the internet yet, but yeah, um, I'll go ahead and do that. Then I'll, 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 um, I'll put the link on Mattermost. Uh, okay, good. Or I can email to people. And then, and then, uh, and then once we get a recording also to, uh, oh, cool. then, uh, post, if we can post that in Mattermost as well. All right. Thank you, Thank you David.